uh, investors, the beneficiary, and an investment bank. And so this kind of combination, and I think I'm going to leave that to Sherry to go into greater detail on, that, on how, that's, how that's worked, has been a successful one. Another case would be in terms of facilities funds. As we're talking, nonprofit facilities represent an enormous collateral base. And the uh, idea there is to aggregate the capital needs of nonprofits and market, market them as a bundle to financial institutions. The example here is the Community Health Facilities Fund. Um, it was created by two trade organizations in, uh, in, in, in the healthcare area. And basically, both for hospitals and for mental health facilities care, um, with to obtain low-cost fixed-rate loans. The borrowers could finance new construction, renovation, and acquisition of property and high-cost debt. It's this model to provide loans finance that have a 25-year term, an interest rate that's below the prime rate, and it's fixed for the term of the loan, and adds up to around 90% of the appraised value of the assets. Uh, it's been an interesting example. The other example is a, a hospital. Uh, fund uh, in the nonprofit uh, junk bond area, basically, 501c3 bonds. Um, other examples that, that have a higher rating because they're, uh, they still have a shadow guarantee from the city of New York would be, for instance, the Bryant Park Redevelopment Corporation, the, general, uh, the, the Grand Central Partnership uh, bonds that, that were done uh, to do the renovation, um, that the, the renovation that was done uh, around the public library and around the Grand Central Station. It's a great example because that's all, that corporation's been involved also in the delivery of public services. Uh, those of you who go to New York very often, it's the, the back end of the public library. Um, I used to teach right there and I was, I, I was a, a consultant on the early uh, bond issue and on the formation of the corporation. It was really interesting because if you remember Bryant Park when it was a really a, a uh, a cesspool of sorts. I mean, it was drugs. Everything was being sold in that park. Uh, prostitutes. I mean, it was just, it was, a, it was a bad place. And now it's really the sort of quadrangle of the central campus of Manhattan, uh, where there are movies on Thursday nights during the summer, the fashion shows there. There are two uh, world-class restaurants. I've uh, been uh, 35 and a $40 million bond issue. Um, generated, you take an underutilized asset like a public park and turn it into a revenue generator. Those are examples of the type of, of facilities funding, uh, and that's what the nonprofits facilities uh, uh, fund we uh, talked about earlier is trying to do. PRIs, I think, represent another way of doing that, way that foundations can invest a portion of their endowment with the intention of receiving both a financial return and a mission oriented return. Um, and uh, sometimes they include below market rate loans, lines of credit, equity, and loan guarantees. And the question of bundling those PRIs or finding the ones that have, ha have greater profit uh, potential or revenue generating potential would be a good example there. Another would be the sides of side-by-side -side, uh, you know, venture experiments that, uh, for instance, the Rockefeller uh, Foundation uh, has done in terms of making investments of around $17 million in patient capital to businesses that contribute to the Rockefeller Foundation's mission. Um, that's uh, uh, been deals that are at the high financial risk end of the spectrum. And after four years, all the investments in that fund are performing. Similar things have been done by, uh, in conjunction with the National Prostate Foundation uh, and in other cure areas, Faster Cures is working on that. Go to their, their website. But to, and, and a number of uh, biotech funds that are that are trying to focus on specific targets, in a sense, leveraging somewhat off of the intellectual capital that's being developed by the foundations on, 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 uh, with another side. So it's a sense bringing the right hand and the left hand side together, not only the balance sheet, but of the organizations or the foundations in a way that creates venture capital types of returns. The other example of an innovation is, is the creation and development of loan loss reserves. A loan loss reserve is a pool of money that's contributed to by borrowers, uh, sometimes lenders and of oftentimes uh, outside guarantors, and it's designed to cover losses on a loan portfolio. That's sort of the basic idea in some of the revolving loan funds. It's allowed uh, credit-worthy entities to loan its credit rating to a more risky lender. That, I think, is really a, a, a very important example. It's certainly a, uh, um, uh, that 
that aspect of leveraging off of uh, balance sheets is really uh, a lesson that certainly was learned in kind of the regulatory arbitrage that occurred in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, where Bear Stearns and others entered markets and basically uh, did that. Now, I think there's a page from that playbook that really does apply here as well. Um, capital access programs, and there's one that we've looked at more closely than others here in California, are a good example of that. The CalCap program provides a loan loss reserve account for eligible loans, provides funds to match funds paid to account into the account by borrowers and sellers. They basically create this, uh, loan, uh, this insurance, this risk insurance pool of around 8%. The default rate's been more like 3.5%, so we've had a loan loss reserve that's overinsured uh, for the losses. Um, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a quite successful model, and it's uh, been replicated in 18 states. Um, and that's just the way that one works. Uh, that's, that's a wiring diagram for, for that particular one. Uh, there's others, I think, you know, some of the things, Joe Lamarta's here from uh, uh, California Community Foundation, I think the example of what they're doing on and, and the Urban Land Institute has developed in terms of uh, land banking represents another uh, one as well. Credit enhancement really does represent uh, a good opportunity, investment opportunity in an area of financial innovation. That's uh, through the provision of letters of credit. Again, it kind of works off, uh, CalSTRS has been very effective uh, with that in their urban and in their real estate area been a good business for them, and they use a strong balance sheet and a credit rating to help reduce the default risk and the cost of the bonds it supports. Now, this is an example of using a financial innovation out of the uh, bond market, both public and corporate, and, uh, and basically getting the, uh, allowing the credit enhancer to have some type of return. I think the example is also uh, could be generalized as a way of um, you know, this question of bridging between market if you go back to the little diagram about the investment continuum, is how do you bridge between market rate and non-market rates of returns? Well, one way might be to have the patient capital or the foundation of the philanthropic fund come in at a concessionary rate of, uh, as a concessionary investor, be willing to accept a lower rate of return, and in a sense, uh, just call it what it is, a cross-subsidy to the market rate investor. So uh, the credit enhancement's a specific case of that, but I can't think of any good reason why you wouldn't want to do that. As, uh, uh, um, and, and actually the same foundation could invest both at a market rate and it could invest at a concessionary rate. And that I think that provides uh, both a mission leverage as well as a return leverage and doesn't compromise uh, uh, any prudent man rules or fiduciary issues um, in my non-legal opinion. So <laughs> So, uh, but in just in terms of an intuitive sense, I don't see why, what's the problem? So, <laughs> uh, I think that, that would be an important area, this whole question of credit enhancement, if you create a fund and maybe appeal to larger foundations as ways to do that. Loan guarantees are another area. Um, uh, loan guarantees really, in a sense, like loan loss reserves, basically try to leverage the balance sheets of financial institutions that wouldn't invest in a social enterprise. Uh, and you basically have the nonprofit parent of a social enterprise uh, places funds to reserve a guarantee for the loan. I mean, that could be done in all sorts of issues where you're trying to deal with poverty mitigation. Uh, in a sense, you know, the enormous amounts of money probably in an endowment fund like a campus like this, not too sure why uh, part of that, you know, couldn't go or couldn't be affected or leveraged in that way. Um, so I'm just sort of quickly going through some of the tool chest of financial innovations that could be useful in the application of this model. The other is, you know, equity equivalent investments. Uh, uh, we covered this in a report we did for the Ford Foundation on uh, uh, the transfer of financial technology to low-income communities. And that's really an equity debt hybrid capital product that's similar to a convertible preferred with a coupon. It protects investors from losses. Uh, that must be repaid, but acts as collateral to leverage further senior debt, just like equity. Um, in 1997, the National Association of Community Development Loan Funds accepted a million dollar investment from, uh, from Citibank to capitalize their central fund. 
In doing so, they introduced uh, this tool, this equity equivalent investment, which uh, works to leverage additional uh, debt and enables, it also enabled Citibank to solve a problem they had of meeting its capital, uh, uh, its, uh, its community